to welcome you all to the Marudia Show, where we are meeting Muslims where they are. Today's topic, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we want to kind of delve into this issue of domestic violence. Domestic violence is prevalent in just about every religious community, and it is amongst the Muslim community very seldom spoken about in lectures, conferences, uh, seminars. I have been Muslim for 17 years and I have never once heard a three-day conference or lecture regarding domestic violence. That doesn't necessarily mean that those lectures don't exist. I'm just negating my knowledge of those particular things. So today, inshallah ta'ala, we want to kind of delve in a little bit and talk about some of the issues surrounding domestic violence in the Islamic community. Why do some of the sisters stay in abusive relationships? What actually makes or constitutes a domestic abuser? And what are some of the important questions that women need to ask men during the either sit-down process or the getting to know one another process to discern whether or not she is dealing with someone who is a domestic abuser? abuser. So today on the show, inshallah ta'ala, I have a very, very special guest uh, who is no stranger to this topic. And that is none other than Dr. Abdullah Hakeem Quick. Thanks for coming on the show. So I want to kind of just jump right into this uh, topic, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, number one, define uh, domestic abuser or domestic violence. Because sometimes when people hear domestic violence, they tend to think that that's just physically a man beating on a woman. And sometimes we tend to not understand that it's probably more psychological, mental, and sometimes vice versa. Maybe it could be the woman beating on the man. You know? So define domestic violence and who is a domestic abuser? Uh, Islam itself, as a divine way of life, uh, has its prescriptions based upon revelation. And in the relationship of marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Imsakun bi ma'roof, tasrihan bi ihsan. That is, that you, you know, take, uh, you come together uh, with ma'roof. And so that is goodness and righteousness. And uh, even if you break up, you break up uh, in a state of righteousness. So, in other words, the ma'roof is that uh, the relationship of the husband and wife is one of, as Quran says, it is love and mercy, um, it is respect, and it's also based on justice. This concept of adl, of justice, uh, is another very important concept in the marriage itself. So based upon that, and based upon the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who was reported to have never uh, struck any woman in his house, abuse can be not only physical, uh, it can also be psychological. Uh, it could be intellectual. So anytime a person goes over the limits and is harming the other, the other individual, oppressing the other individual, then that can be a form of abuse. And uh, there will be different levels. And of course, the worst form is to physically strike uh, the individual or to cause an individual to lose their mind uh, or to resort to drugs or some other strange behavior. But you mentioned intellectual abuse. Like, talk about that. What, how does a person intellectually abuse their spouse, how does that happen? You know, there are some cases where the person uh, puts down the other individual. Uh -huh. So the man says, you know, you're nothing and your family is nothing, you don't have a mind, you, know, you don't have an education, you know, and, and, and they belittle their mind to such an extent that the individual, the woman for instance, would develop an inferiority complex and would actually, you know, manifest strange behaviors because she has no respect for herself. Uh, you know, in some cases, uh, a woman can even be driven to an like, animal level where she only sees that her place in life is a sexual one or just to feed and, you know, her husband and to, and to serve her husband. That's not the case in Islam. The case in Islam is that a woman is a private individual and that she is respected and that she has the same rights uh, as a man has. Uh, she has the same respect, the same dignity uh, as a man has. So, so abuse is not allowed in any way, whether it's the body or whether it's the mind. Okay, so my, my next issue, um, and I'm glad that you defined that for us, uh, is 
What are some of the qualities that constitute a domestic abuser? How, how does a man or a woman, for that matter, and let's concentrate more so on the man because there are instances where um, women are abusive towards their spouses. There are incidents. Um, however, those are in comparison to the abuses that women suffer at the hands of their husbands are almost a non-factor when we compare the two. So what are some of the things that, that, that a man might go through in his life that may create this sentiment of abuse, physical abuse or mental abuse or psychological abuse? What makes a domestic abuser? A domestic abuser really, uh, when a man uh, reaches that stage, he's actually a very sick person. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it usually begins from childhood. Uh, if he has experienced abuse himself, in many cases, an, an abuser was originally abused. Wow, really? Or the abuser saw his father, saw his parent abusing the other. Okay. And so therefore, it's like a, you know, a type of imprint of, uh, of hatred and you know, animosity towards the opposite sex. And sometimes the young child actually manifests this um, in different ways, become, becoming rude and arrogant uh, toward his mother. Uh, and then later on, you know, he plays himself out in a marriage relationship, you know, where he actually goes to the point of uh, physical violence. In terms of abuse itself, um, each society, you know, has its own standard. Uh, or its own way of defining abuse. Yes. Uh, within Islam, uh, the Prophet um, you know, did not allow uh, any type of uh, uh, physical, you know, beating or anything, you know, on, on the front side of an individual. And really, you know, what was allowed, if the man, in the case of the new shoes, where the, where the woman is, you know, completely outside, she's not praying, you know, she's she's like, you know, completely outside of Islam. In order to um, straighten her up, um, what was allowed is what is called Donabun Ghayru Mubarak. And that is a strike, or, or that is a type of, you know, just touching the person that leaves no mark at all. It's almost like, like they say, it's almost like taking a handkerchief and striking a person with a handkerchief. Now we know in reality that is like doing nothing at all. And so, therefore, our advice to Muslims, and I'm very clear about this. It is best to avoid. It is best to avoid um, violence 100 percent because there's no uh, limit. Really, most men, when they get angry, they will lose control of themselves. And so, really, according to Islam and according to the society that we're living in here, a man actually should not be striking a woman uh, under any circumstances. There's no real circumstance why we should do this. And those who think they're pious enough uh, that they will. You know, strike with a tiny miswak or, or with a handkerchief. Uh, that that society is past. We're in a different uh, society now. Absolutely, absolutely. So the uh, the male domestic abuser, a lot of times, he's projecting on his spouse the pain and you know the damage that was done to him. So he's basically someone who has some illnesses, some sicknesses that he needs to work through. Is there something, is there some early stages that a woman can discern whether or not this individual is going to go that route or not? Like when she's during the sit down process in the slam, are there some things that a woman can ask a man to determine whether or not he has had that experience in his life? Well, again, it's, it's very important that um, the relationship between husband and wife, uh, it actually begins in the marriage process. And that is that the wali, the wali, the guardian of the woman, they should check that man out. And in many cases, they will ask the man, like, where do you come from? What type of people are you? Uh, what is your personality? You know, are there individuals you know who know you? You know, and so um, you can you can detect from a person's background, you know, the type of people who live in that area, and then also from recommendations of people who know that individual. Is that individual somebody? You know, who loses control. What I used to do uh, after many years of being imam in the mosque here in Toronto, uh, I gave up imamate and we opened up a social service center. Really? So what I would do is I would counsel people before they got married. And one of the tests that I would put the men through is that um, I'd bring the husband, the future husband and wife, and then um, there's a discussion, and then a point of disagreement. So now, 
uh, she says something which is against his opinion. Okay? Or I say something which is against his opinion. And she sees how he reacts to that. Because if it's the man or the woman, you know, the man is on his best, and, oh darling, and he's so worthy and everything. But now, if he's questioned about something, there was a case of, of a person who came from uh, the Middle East, and, and, and there was a, a, a real Canadian sister, um, you know, who uh, you know, was about to get married. And so I just threw out the question, you know, um, what's your opinion on uh, household chores? What's your opinion on your role? And she spoke as a liberated Canadian woman, and I, I want my independence and whatnot. He didn't like it. His face turned red, and he stopped. He changed in front of her. It was the first time she had ever seen him. He was such a noble, uh, valiant, you know, lover. Now she sees how angry he was, and he was about to fight me right in front of her. Now I did that on purpose so she could see him get mad. Then she could see right from the beginning who she's dealing with. So it starts with the, the wali, and then understanding the background of that person. And then the wali, they should test him as well. She should spend some time, the others spend time. Before you get married, take time to understand this individual before you get into marriage. This speaks volumes to many of the marriages that I've done, you know, where there is no sit-down process. There is no premarital counseling and people just going off the basis that you're cute, I'm cute, let's marry, you know, or under the guise of halal sex, you know, let's just, I wanna have sex, you wanna have sex, the only way we can do that is to get married, and we get married, and you're not realizing the type of individual that you are marrying, the background that they come from. Um, so, when we talk about domestic violence in the Islamic community, a lot of times, it's almost like taboo. You bring this discussion up in any mosque or to any imam, in, in most cases, um, I'm sure there's some exceptions to the rule, but those exceptions are not actually the rule. But if you bring this discussion up, you'll find that many mosques or imams or imams or, or mosque leaders will be quick to say, no, that doesn't happen in my community, and to, to kind of brush it off as if it doesn't exist. And we know it does exist. Why is it so hard? for the Islamic community to have the discussion about these issues. Why is it so difficult? The case with Islam is a special, and that is that we are not only a faith community, but we are a community that has been blessed with a living example of, of the Prophet. Most of the great religions cannot uh, trace the life of their Prophet. But in our case, we still have the revelation, we still have the life of the Prophet Muhammad right in front of us. So we have some very high ideals. So therefore, when these ideals are around and, and the reality is there, you know, sometimes people feel very ashamed because the, the ideal is, is a living thing which is in front of them in a sense. That the Sunnah lives, you know, through the, the, the descriptions of the Prophet and his companions that has come to us. Other communities um, make up stories about their prophets. They may not really understand, you know, who their righteous ones are. And so they may be more susceptible to, you know, uh, feeling justified in violence. But Muslims cannot feel justified at all. And then, so a great deal of shame and denial uh, comes about, you know, within our community. Yeah, but, but not having these discussions leaves Muslim women, in, in, in most instances, to feel like they don't have a voice in the community. There's no one to stand up for justice for the women. So you have now in Los Angeles, you now have the first American Muslim woman's mosque that is now being, you know, erected and, and is going to be basically ran by women. You know, women are going to call the Adhan on Jumu'ah, is going to give the khutbah on Jumu'ah, is going to lead the Salah on Jumu'ah solely for women. And because we don't have these conversations, it gives birth, it gives birth to entities like that, which are totally un-Islamic. You know, because women start to feel like we don't have a voice, we don't have someone to represent us. In the mosque, when a woman comes to the, her local imam and says that she's been beaten or hit or, you know, disrespected by her husband, the imam is, you know, leaving her with this cliche advice, just be patient, sister, inshallah, everything will work out. And as the years go by, people begin to evolve. Their mental begins to evolve. Their, their level of imam begins to evolve, evolve, and that is no longer sufficient those type of responses is no longer sufficient. 
and people want more. They want more. I mean, we, we boast about having all of this knowledge of Quran and the Sunnah, but yet and still we're afraid to have discussions about something as basic as a man punching his wife in the face. You know, so these things give birth to other things. You know, as we talked about earlier with the issue of oppression, that, you know, oppression will eventually balance itself out. You know, you can't continue to allow people to be oppressed and not address those things. So I believe in the Islamic community that we have done our women a tremendous injustice by not combating this and confronting this with lectures, with seminars, with educating the brothers in the community. You know? And you know, and also, uh, I feel very strongly that uh, every masjid and sense it needs to have a safe zone, Absolutely. a place where a woman or she or a young person uh, can come in and, and, and feel that they could tell their story and that nobody's going to say it to other people and that they can be very open and very clear. What we had to develop was uh, a safe zone, not in the loss. Uh, we put it next to them. And therefore, we opened up the center. And I think this is a natural development in the same way that masjids you know, had a, a, a madrasa, you know, a school, and then also you find masjids having gymnasiums for the youth, to play sports. Now we need to have a social service center, a safe zone, so that anybody within our community, if there is a woman who is abused, if there is a, a child, a, a youth who had there's abuse, drug problem, uh, homosexuality, adultery, whatever it is. They can come in and they can speak openly and freely and they will not be punished, they will not be humiliated, uh, they will be respected uh, and, 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 and their, their words will be held in secret. And, and, and that is something that Muslim uh, leaders need to be trained in as to how to maintain secrets, and how to deal with somebody uh, you know, in counseling and handling some of these very serious problems. I ran into a case of a brother and a sister. The brother was a very strong, you know, working type of brother. The sister was short, but she was fiery, fiery sister. Napoleon. Yeah, Napoleon type of sister, right? And, um, and, and so she knew his weakness. She had a problem too. And so they came to me and she was bruised. And they said, help us. I said, what is the situation? She said that he would come back from work and she would look at him and she would say things to him. Like you little man, you, you, who you think you are, you can't even take care of your family. And he would get angry and he couldn't control himself and he would strike her. So it was like a, it was a type of a cycle of abuse. It's like masochism when you take it on yourself and say this, you know, when you give it. So what is the solution? I went to this great scholar of Islam, Sheikh of Mandanfodi, Rahimullah, West Africa, a great scholar of Islam, in line with the Sunnah. It's a type of Islamic psychology. And according to the Sunnah, if you cannot control yourself, if you feel anger, utter, you're boiling up, the Prophet you know, they basically said, he said, if you're standing, sit down. This is real. So that's what I told him. If you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting and it's still coming, lay down. If it's still coming, make wudu. Like, Wash up, put water on yourself. And make this the other in the shaitan. And you should, you know, turn to your ear, your right shoulder, you know, uh, even spit over it, you know, seek refuge from the devil. Because there's some type of waswisa or whispering, you know, in the mind. I gave them another uh, level of it. That, you know, if you sat down, you laid down, you put water on yourself, and it's still coming, leave the room. Just leave the room. Just don't be involved and, and get control of yourself. Seek refuge from, from the devil and gain control of yourself. Um, you know, and, and, and then breathe. You know, do two rakats. Leave the house. But I also had advice for her that, that, that she needs to watch the things that she said to him. Because to a certain extent she was bringing it on. I don't blame her. I don't fault her for this. But in a sense, uh, it takes two to tango. And so, um, you know, Muslim women must not look at the, upon themselves as victims and, and that they need to be abused or, you know, have this concept in their mind. I was giving a halaqa uh, sometimes to this group of Muslim women and they told me, I'm not saying which culture it is, they said in my culture, some women were taught 
that if a woman does not get a beating, she will not enter paradise. That's the level. And I said, this is sick. Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu empowered them. Islam empowers them. And we even take it a step further. I would suggest that Muslim women should learn self-defense. We had a case in Toronto where there was a, a, a man who was raping women in the Scarborough area. This is in the 90s. He was only raping Muslim women. So we had special uh, martial arts courses, like a Wendor type of woman's self-defense, street-proofing type of thing. So the sisters would now take the self-defense. They could wear their Islamic clothes. A woman was teaching. And at the end of the class, Zainab then broke, breaks a board. Right? And it said Zainab broke the board in June 29, 2010. Right? And so then, you know, she, um, she goes home and she puts it over her bed. Right? And next time Zayd was about to hit her, he looked at the board. And he said, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Right, right, we, you know, we will have shura. Because right. that board was what they call manik, right. zajik. Right? This is what the Hindu in Islam. It prevents evil. So, so being prepared can actually prevent evil. On the part of the Muslim women, Muslim women must no longer be victims of this. They have to become independent. They have to be strong. They have to be no self-defense. They need to have skills to provide for themselves. They need to involve their wali. If there are new Muslims, the Prophet said, a sultan wali, men la wali That the local authority needs to provide walis for these systems. That's the Islamic system, is checks and balances. And if it goes a step further, there needs to be brothers in the community who are prepared to enforce Islam. If we can work with the local authorities, um, you know, get the local authorities involved. We don't want to go to that level. But, you know, that hand of justice Absolutely. has to stand above the home. You know, and, and, and that's the way the Islamic system is. Because human nature is that people are inclined to evil or violence. Violence is something part of our nature. So our Islam is, 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 is taking the evil out of us. And, and, and the fact that there is justice in Islamic society also prevents you know, the evil from occurring. Well, I want to go back to the point that you made about um, women, Muslim women, not to really considering themselves victims in this. And that one of the things you mentioned was that she should gain some type of financial independence, which was a question that I wanted to ask you is, why do Muslim women stay in abusive relationships? What is, the, what is in the psyche of a Muslim woman that makes her say, I have to stay in this situation. And sometimes it may be due to financial restraints. It could be due to, you know, not having a skill set to go out and earn your own. So can you elaborate on that? Well, more this is part of it. Part of it is physical, which is literally the fact that he is providing for the family. Okay. And she needs to have a provider. And if she doesn't have any way to provide for herself, then, then she's going to take more abuse in order to maintain her children. Mm -hmm. See, because when a woman thinks, she thinks not only for herself, but for the family. Whereas when a man thinks, he thinks for himself. Right? So therefore, a woman will more than likely stay within uh, a negative situation in order to you know, protect the children. Another problem is that cultural Islam, in many cases, Muslims take their, their, their religion from their culture. And in some cultures, the family says to that girl, you're married to him, and you will stay married with him until you die. That's their concept. You're going nowhere. And it's a cultural thing because Islam allows divorce. Uh, Islam even gives a woman the right to come out of the marriage, you know, through the khulah and through, you know, cancellation. There's ways for women to, you know, to come out of a marriage herself. But today, part of our problem is ignorance. It is the ignorance of our religion and also to take the sunnah to a deeper level, not just two rakat sunnah and nas. Not just a nice stove or you know a nice you know salams. What is the lifestyle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How did he solve the problems? What did Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala legislate in order to solve the problems? And so you know when we are aware of this, you know that a woman knows her rights. But when she's not aware of it, she in a sense falls into a trap. She falls into a trap, you know, and, and this uh, uh, you know can be a very dangerous thing. And the last question is something that was given to me prior to us uh, doing this interview, and that is, 
the woman who was divorced. You have divorced women who, uh, because of their divorce a lot of time, feel shame. There's a shame that is attached to more so the divorced woman than the divorced man. The divorced man is like that, you know, like I'm free, you know, I'm out of that situation and move on to my next situation. Whereas the woman, she carries the shame with her. Uh, and sometimes that shame puts her in a situation where she is almost embarrassed to, you know, pursue marriage after that. So she lives in the oblivion of her own self pity and she begins to believe that she doesn't deserve to be in another marriage. How can we, what type of advice could we give to a woman who is going through this, you know, this uh, post-marital shame? Again, we need to go back, you know, to our, our teachings. Our teachings, you know, show us that there's no shame for a woman uh, who's been divorced. Because there are, you know, great women in the who have been divorced. The Prophet Muhammad so seldom married, uh, you know, women who were divorced. Yeah. And, and he is the best of creation. So there's, there's no shame, but culturally, in some cultures, they blame the woman for everything. Whether she was right or wrong, she's wrong. That's not Islam. That's not Islam. And so this is where it's very important for the family to step in. You know, the wali, um, you know, the brothers, the uncles, extended family, the community to support a woman who is going through, you know, uh, in, in an inter period or going through divorce. She needs to be supported. And she needs to be respected and, and, and empowered by the community itself, itself. That's why I say we need to really seriously think about, you know, this Ahli system, about taking care of each other, you know, providing mechanisms within our communities, uh, seeing Islam as more than just symbolic salams, but actually caring more and, and, and closing our ranks. Islam is a jama'ah, it is a group, and that group takes care of itself. And so when we have the, those things in place, you know, then we're able to handle some of these, you know, very uh, critical situations that Muslim women find themselves in today. MashaAllah, I appreciate you coming. Thank you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for all that you share with us and perhaps, inshallah ta'ala, people can listen to this and draw some benefit from it. Um, thank you for attending the Maradiyya show. Inshallah ta'ala, stay tuned.